Uh, I just I'll try and see if I can speak for a minute because um, otherwise I might explode. I get very excited <laughs> <laughs> about what we hear and see. And um, so it's one of the things that's just been bubbling up in me in the past few weeks that I thought I've seen for so many years. <laughs> But it's just, the reality of it has just become so fresh and new once again. And that is to realize the absolute completeness and reality of the salvation that God achieved for us. That what we hear in this gospel is not a product that's on offer for sale. (laughs) But what we hear is the good news of an event in what God in which God achieved everything on our behalf that He could ever achieve. So the good news is not some and Paul writes about it, he says we're not peddling the word. This this gospel is not a salesmanship. We we declaring the good news of an accomplished event. And just the reality of the salvation. You know, often I've heard messages where that left me still confused whether what, what Jesus achieved, was that just legally real? Was it just um, potentially yeah. to my benefit? And I've just come to the conclusion that what God achieved is simply real. It is, the, it is real in the most yeah, real way and complete way it can be real. <laughs> and if our reality and our experience doesn't confirm it, it's because we're in a slumber. The reality is what he achieved. And I was um, once again just reminded of the fact that I'm sure many of you have heard the the statement that says Jesus was 100% God and 100% man and I was thinking about what does that mean and we know that one of the problems of the old covenant is that God was completely faithful from his side in establishing relationship. But there was always a problem that the other party wasn't faithful. (laughs) And so this relationship was continually interrupted by an unfaithful party called man. And but God's wonderful master plan was that within the salvation that he would accomplish in Christ, both God and man's contribution would be given in this one person. So Jesus is not only God's initiative to reach out and embrace humanity. He also represents man's response, perfect response of faith to embrace what God has done for us. He's 100%. He's, he represents God 100%. And He represents humanity 100%. But he doesn't just represent the mess of humanity in which you just dwindle to an insignificant part. He represents you personally. So what happened in in his life, in his death, in his resurrection and his ascension, wasn't just something he did for you. Of course he did it for you. But he also did something with you, and he also did something on your behalf. (laughs) As you. As you. He represented you. And when God became man, he embraced humanity. And that union that he established between God and man in in the incarnation 
was a union that would never be broken. That union went through death and hell and came out intact on the other side. And that's why we read in Timothy where he speaks about there is one mediator between God and man. And that's the man, Christ Jesus. Do you realize that when God became man, he would never again not be man. (laughs) This wasn't a temporary arrangement for a once-off event. When God became man, He forever bound Himself to humanity. And after His resurrection, He testified. His resurrection is the testimony that this union is permanent. This union is forever. And what does His ascension mean? You know, if, if He's... If the incarnation, if God becoming man was an act in which God humbled himself of all his divine privileges in in taking on human form, then the ascension is testimony to God glorifying man and taking us up once again to the position for which we were always destined and designed. We were always meant to be in the circle of fellowship of the Godhead. That is where we were thought of, where we were birthed, before the existence of evil, before the existence of anything, when there was only God. The only thing that he had in mind is, I want to include someone in this fellowship that will intrigue me through all eternity. Someone in whom I can invest all my love and in whose conversation I will be interested for all eternity. And that's when God thought of you. And He declares the end from the beginning. And what He accomplished in Christ doesn't come to us as a message to say, you might benefit from this or not. This is a message to say, this is the truth. God sees you included. God sees you in Christ. And when you see it, <laughs> it doesn't make, the fact that God accomplished it, doesn't make less of a demand on you to respond in faith. The reality, this is why Paul preaches in Galatians 3, he says, haven't we vividly portrayed before your eyes the crucifixion of Christ? He wasn't speaking about this event as some potential benefit that we can bargain with. That if you give us, if you give me your decision or your faith, then I can trade you. Yeah. With this benefit, he portrayed the reality of what God accomplished for us in such a way that it arrested their attention when they were confronted with the reality of their salvation in such a way that they knew if I walk away from this, I will live in deception for the whole of my life. What God reveals is true, is real. And he simply wants to awake us yeah. and say, if your, if your experience contradicts it, your experience can be changed. <laughs> sure. We were reading in John 8 earlier today where Jesus says, my judgment is true because I do not judge in the narrowness of my own experience. Now, if Jesus, the Son of God, God incarnate, can say that my experience as a man. is too narrow as a man, is too narrow as a reference for truth, (laughs) then we've got to realize that our experience can't be our reference for truth. Then he carries on, he says, but in the largeness of the Father. We found a new reference, the heart of God. Thank you, Francois. Come and bless us.